Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much. Okay, so what we're going to touch on are the opportunities in local SA property and global property. Um, I think what's very important, and we, we call this slide the smarty box um, internally, we, we look at uh, how the asset classes have done historically and what's been the driver behind property in many of those years. Now, property is the yellow blocks. The light yellow blocks is developed market property, which is global property. The bright yellow blocks are SA property, the OP and the SAP index. And you can see if you just go back a couple of years, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, were pretty torrid years for property as an asset class, um, besides VM property. SA property did pretty poorly. We had Viceroy, we had the resilient debacle, we had issues around valuations, discomfort with the sector, et cetera. Um, we had COVID happen as well. So, you know, it, it was just the perfect storm of negativity hitting the sector. And then come late 2020, the announcement of the vaccine came through, um, the vaccine rollout happened, 2021 happened, um, COVID restrictions, lockdown started becoming easier. And we started seeing the property sector rally. I think over the last 12 months, the sector is up about 60 to 70 percent, uh, one of the best performing asset classes in the 12 month view. So the sector's come back in a strong way. Um, and I think that is a function of it being oversold last year. Um, obviously, in the early 2000 years, were years of strong growth, and the sector was often a top performing sector. But the sector is very much on the way to recovery in South Africa, with a lot of the bad news very much in the price sector. If I just look back over 2020 and 2021 in detail, because I think it's important to understand what's happened and where we're going from here. Uh, March 2020 saw the South African property sector fall 36%. This was more, it fell, than during resilient concerns, viceroy concerns, other concerns in the market. This was the biggest fall I can remember ever seen. Come November 2020, the vaccine got rolled out and the sector rallied a lot, having been oversold. The volatility in the sector has been immense in the last few years. That is, that is now normalizing and we're getting back to the historical type of volatility that the sector experienced uh, prior to the last three years. So more normalized, more normal, with more normal expected returns from here. Looking at the property sector in terms of rate hikes, and I think it's particularly relevant given the 35 basis point hike we've had today, um, What's key to note is that in the three to six months before the rate hike, property tends to underperform other asset classes. What's also very important to note is that in the six to 12 months after the rate hike, the first rate hike, property tends to outperform those other asset classes. So what's very important to remember is we're now entering that environment. Um, We've come off the COVID dynamic to a large extent, and a lot of the COVID relief granted to tenants is now rolling off very much. And the yield on the sector is approaching 10%, uh, which is quite attractive relative to bonds and many other asset classes. Looking at some of the subsector themes to extract alpha in the sector, we touch on retail first, and the high profits, the big regional malls, now walk, the grid, those bank. Etc. Hyde Park, North Pole as well has those assets, and Fairvest has community shopping centers, which is the smaller type of footprint. What we're finding is that the community shopping centers have been quite well um, with the big uh, grocery anchors. The large shopping centers have rebased their rentals a lot lower, more normalized, more appropriate rentals. And we're starting to see recovery emerge probably in 2023 quite strongly on that side of a rebased uh, income base. Office is still a big concern. Growth point in redefined diversified stocks have a lot of exposure there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. You know, work from home, hybrid working model, et cetera. You know, who's going back to the office, who isn't? Do you need so much space anymore, et cetera? A lot of, lot of moving parts. That's a sector that for many years we think will still be um, underappreciated and unwanted. Um, there's a lot of supply needs to be so tight. The logistics space continues to do well. Equities, domestic property fund with European logistics storage space as well. Residential, you know, rentals have fallen in residential in the affordable segment. Um, that is now becoming increasingly appropriately rebased 
and starting to bottom up, uh, right to lower lentils on that side. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of the offshore stuff, Sirius, EPP, Neprop, um, German Center of Europe exposure continues to do very well. Um, the companies are seeing a strong recovery in those markets in GDP growth and underlying economics, which supports the recovery. And then the key risks for the next year is obviously going to be you know, rising inflation, supply chain issues, ESCOM, um, and then vaccine logistics. Um, having been rolled out, there's obviously an element that is uncertain whether they want to take the vaccine. And it's probably slowing down the production to some extent um, of dealing with the COVID crisis. Looking at some detail at the sectors to give you a bit of color there. The retail escalations are averaging around 7%, anchor signing at about 6% level. Reversions have started to moderate, um, still negative, but uh, to a much less extent than was historically the case. Um, the rent to sales ratio continue to look better and better, so the affordability for the tenants getting better. And then the trading densities are starting to improve. You know, we're starting to see guys shopping less, but taking bigger baskets out. So those dynamics are all starting to come through. So we're covering off a low base um, with the restriction is now supporting the recovery in this space. <coughs> so escalations are always topical. You know, historically, there was a big gap between inflation in SA and the escalation rates that tend to decide. That's starting to narrow the difference between the two. But we still expect that the landlord will be able to pass through escalations about inflation. So that's quite important. And then on the global side, with inflation as high as 6% in the US and in other developed markets now with supply chain issues, um, a lot of those leases are indexed to inflation. So that means that when those leases are renewed, they're going to see reasonable upticks to, to new levels. Looking at the SA retail footprint in terms of size of uh, retail assets, the super regional assets, obviously, a bit of high risk there for the tenants on the um, apparel side, clothing. Entertainment would still kind of cause a big issue. Um, but the community shopping centers are relatively safe because they are largely anchored with the, the big food anchors. And they tend to be pretty good in terms of future rentals. Um, we also are seeing that a lot of the rentals in the food space are at the appropriate level. Um, apparel as well has now been rebased very much to the appropriate level. And very much for these type of centers, it's about rebasing the rental, right-sizing the tenant, getting the tenant mix right in the centers, not chasing rentals at all costs, and we're finding more that the companies are doing the right things, uh, making the centers more and more sustainable. This slide talks about e-commerce, basically talking about the fact that, you know, true words, Woolies, Shini, all getting into that game more and more. Um, penetration rates are still very low, but we are expecting uh, more and more for that to become a dynamic as a, another income stream for a lot of these companies. Talking about the office space in terms of vacancies, um, it's a concern. I mean, our Santon office vacancies are 25% roughly if you talk to growth for the fortress. Um, that's going to take years to fix, we believe. You can't convert all, all office to residential. Some office doesn't lend itself to that conversion. You're going to end up with some space that cannot be converted. That is basically redundant. Um, a lot of supply in the space going into COVID. So it's going to take years for that to fix. And then you add to it, obviously, hybrid, work from home, COVID, all of these things accelerated trends that were already evident in the market. <coughs> Looking at the, the cost growth dynamic, I mean, this is an essay phenomenon. So we ran quite a, quite big increases in recent years in rates and taxes, electricity, municipal charges. That is a, a problem to some extent. It's the total cost of occupation facing the tenant has risen. You recover that from the tenant, but it is part of this total cost of occupation, which makes it harder to pass higher rentals and to push rentals upwards with these things.
talking about um, the unrest we saw in 2021, um, most of the, well, all the listed companies we spoke to were overinsured. Um, so they have been able to cover the damages comfortably. In many instances, the damages were minimal to the centers. There were instances like Springfield and SA Corporate Portfolio on the right, which was damaged quite badly and will need to be to some extent rebuilt. But generally speaking, shop fronts, et cetera, fittings like that, windows, they were able to fix quite quickly and bring the centers online with most centers back to trading by August 2021. This slide talks the fact that Central and Eastern Europe is seeing a strong recovery. After the lockdowns that have happened at various times in those markets, the recovery in terms of footfall and turnover has been quite strong. And we expect that to continue, barring obviously further lockdowns happening in those markets. The big issue in the Northern Hemisphere is obviously going to flu season, December, winter, and how that's gonna play out together with COVID um, happening in the markets. This slide for me is quite amazing. Um, the key capital raises last year. I would never have expected um, near 10 billion rand to have been raised over the course of 2021 in terms of capital raises. Initially, you can see in the first part of the year, dividend reinvestments were used as companies retained cash to protect the balance sheet in the year. In the last couple of capital raises since June 2021, um, it's been for acquisitions, raising capital for offshore acquisitions that serious Lighthouse, Equitas, Iron Gate. So the dynamic in the sector has shifted from when we go back two years being insolvencies and liquidations happening to not wanting to catch a falling knife as assets devalue to where we are now, which is where acquisitions are being considered in the market more and more as we as guys become comfortable with evaluations and start seeing upside and the opportunity for corporate action. In this slide, we just break down an income statement on the right hand side, um, looking at um, basically, you know, from rental growth down to operating cost growth, how the loan to value for the sector evolves, peaking in 2022, payout ratio of 80 to 85% at the bottom there in terms of income being distributed, and DPS growth for the sector at 3 to 6% for the next couple of years. So, you know, having gone through COVID and seeing the earnings space decimated, we're now at a point where companies are paying dividends again, and we have increased certainty that no single digit dividend growth is a likely outcome from the sector for the next couple of years. What this slide highlights is the companies left tend to have a lot of offshore operations trading with premiums to book value. Companies on the far right, some of them still have not resumed paying dividends for various reasons, balance sheet issues. And many of the companies in the middle of the sheet, trading at between 0.5 to 0.9 book, tend to be companies with a lot of SA assets, um, not too much maybe of an offshore element, maybe element of retail in the portfolio. Um, yeah, I'm tending to trade below one times book. But if you trade with a large amount of offshore assets or strong logistics, you can attract a rating above one times book then. This is looking at impairments, which was a big issue in 2020. If you look at the top right table, the cumulative declines in asset values, you'll see that a lot of it happened over the last 24 months. The forecast is for minimal devaluations over the next 12 months. We think a lot of the bad news has been priced into the assets already. We don't expect massive positive uplift in asset values, but we do expect a lot of the valuation decline to have happened. The companies on the bottom, on the property watch list tend to be companies with a lot of retail exposure, which we are watching in terms of how bad the devaluation could potentially be, but a lot of them have already taken material devaluations. This is just a slide from Fortress's recent results. If you look at a couple of the lines there, about six from the bottom, reversion on expiring leases, office at minus 27%. You look at the second from bottom line, you'll see valuation change minus 13% on office. And you see the net initial yield or the valuation yield on assets approaching 10% for much of the assets. So the assets are increasingly appropriately valued 
office is still the sector which is seeing a lot of the pain and rentals where they are being renewed in that space are still materially negative. We're still seeing negative rentals on other asset classes like retail and industrial, but not to the same extent we are seeing on office. So, I mean, if you go back to November last year, when the sector had fallen to about 0.45 book after COVID in the March event, having fallen 36% of the sector, um, it was very cheap. And um, I think we saw a lot of general equity investors step into the sector quite aggressively late last year. The sector rallied quite a bit. Those investors still remain invested. Some have taken some element of profits, but the sector has now rallied quite materially from where it was. And we're really getting to the point where it's going to become more of an income yield story than a capital growth story going forward. So we're looking for about 10% yield from the sector with about 4% capital growth for the next 12 odd months. So you're looking at about a 14% return from the sector, having seen it rally about 60% over the last 12 months. <clears throat> looking at the cap rates, I mean, this just highlights on the graph on the right there that cap rates have risen in retail. They have risen in office. Um, we think office can still see a little bit of an increase in, in cap rates to come, assets to devalue a bit more. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to highlight the point here that office does remain an, an area of concern, much more so than regional shopping centers and uh, logistics or industry. If, I, if I'm just to conclude on the SA property story in some detail, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. You know, COVID, as negative as it was, accelerated a lot of the issues that needed to be addressed at the sector. Rather than those issues being allowed to linger, they were compressed into a short time frame. So what am I talking about? Valuations needed to be impaired in assets. Rentals were at unsustainable levels in some instances, given the economic outlook. Escalations needed to be brought down. Loan to values or debt levels needed to be sorted out. The companies took the opportunity of COVID to address a lot of these issues. Where we sit today is a sector that there are a lot less concerns about debt issues for many of the companies. Um, the companies have returned to paying a dividend with the exception of a few companies which are smaller in the sector and have various other issues around the balance sheet. But the big companies, the growth ones, the read the funds, et cetera, and the Nepi Rock House have returned to paying the dividends as expected and giving some element of guidance on that front. Um, the distribution of visibility has improved on the sector. And while the performance has been very strong over the last 12 months, we expect over the next 12 to 24 months to see continued recycling of assets potentially into overseas locations or jurisdictions. Uh, we expect the loan to values to peak in 2022 at around the 40% level in the sector. We expect to see consolidation pick up more and more in the sector, which is something which has become evident. Mergers like potentially Fairvest and Arrowhead, et cetera, happening. Um, one year property returns in SA around the mid T levels. And in the medium term, the NAV of the sector, we're rating for about 0.8 book, with the asset values increasingly hard meaning that the NAVs we are comfortable with that they're not going to fall much from here and that over time they're going to start rising in line with income growth. Looking on to the global side, you'll see this slide we've titled Choice, Choice and More Choice, a veritable small business. We have a global property fund that we run in Standard. So we have a lot of exposure to offshore stocks and many, many developed markets. So we're going to run you through some of the key stocks, key sectors, key thoughts, key secular trends that we think are important, which we look to discuss. What the table on the right shows you is the, the number of type of asset classes you can have. So when we talk in SA, we normally talk retail, office, industrial, logistics, um, storage, and residential as asset classes by and large. When we talk in global, we talk student housing, manufactured homes, mortgage residential, tower companies, um, net lease companies, timber REITs, um, 
it is just so many different ways you can invest in property and play secular trends through property globally. What the table on the right shows here is very much US manufactured homes and UK student housing are expected to be high growth and return subsectors. And then UK retail and US office are still under preferred sectors um, in terms of expected return over the next couple of years. So what's so interesting about global property? You know, we all know about the supply chain disruptions, the shortage of semiconductor chips, the difficulty in getting a new car or a new laptop in this environment. While that is the first derivative, the second derivative is the supply chain logistics happening. You can invest or play that element to companies like Prologis, et cetera. If you believe in Facebook, for example, rebranding as Meta and the Metaverse becoming a reality one day, well, then you have American Tower and Digital Realty, um, 5G, telco companies, massive data center companies. Um, we like storage a lot on the right there, store capital, safe store, extra space storage. The underpinning theme behind that is um, life happens. Um, by that, what we mean is people have children, people get married, people get divorced, people move in, people move out. All of these things happen. And as life happens, you need space. People move to smaller apartments, people move to bigger houses, all of these things happen. And that's where storage space becomes quite key. That's with the supply chain dynamics in terms of the disruptions. SME businesses can use storage space to store some of the raw materials they might need. Then we have on the bottom left is the Novia Equity Lifestyle. Um, Berlin, German residential, massive undersupply of buildings of residential, manufactured homes in the US living in communities. Uh, Equity Lifestyle does very well on that side. So, a lot of these companies are very big. They have very strong underpinning secular drivers behind them, themes that will play out over multi years. Um, and the returns they have generated over the last 10 years reflect that. And we see little evidence that those themes are going to abate um, in the next couple of years. So, if we have to make the investment case for global property, it would be as such. U.S. consumer spending continues to be hitting record highs. Housing market is very buoyant. The housing market post the global financial crisis in 2008 was massively undersupplied. Not enough home for home. The catch-up required to fix that issue will take many years. And you can see that in house price inflation that's coming through already. What we're seeing is the REITs are doing good cash flow. Um, dividends are being upgraded across the board in many instances. Uh, cash is injected in the system more and more, in places like the US, and that's finding its way into households more and more and into household values. And then in terms of the strategic longer term view, you know, as an asset class, you know, it, it, it just continues to grow year on year. The, the breakdown of the asset class has changed very much from being very much retail heavy weighted years ago becoming more data center, towers, more tech orientated as a, as a sector. Um, and then the global companies are continuing to benefit. Free cash flow generation continues to be strong. Um, debt issues don't really exist on the global front. Most companies are not over leveraged. Um, and then we expect you know, from the US, Germany, Sweden, the Nordic countries to generate some of the highest total returns over the next few years. And this just gives you a breakdown of the asset class, the global property market. By breakdown, it's about a $3 trillion market. Um, it's very much skewed to industrial, which is logistics, residential is becoming more and more feature. Retail still pitch features up there, but we're increasingly having sectors like towers and data center, making more, more and more of the mix, and timber reach, et cetera, as well, featuring in the mix as well. If you look at the geography of the global property market, it's very much biased to the US, almost half of it is there. there. Um, Japan, Hong Kong, also very expensive markets for a property front, also feature quite heavily. And then obviously we end up with Europe starting with Germany, et cetera, getting into the mix. So the US is quite a heavy concentration in terms of exposure there to geography. 
and then the rest of it is more evenly spread amongst the other developed markets. Please don't, I'm just looking at the developed market properly here. We don't look too much at emerging markets because that's very much of a developer story, not really about income yield and income return, much more about uh, profit on sale of assets or property on sale of development. So this is talks to that story I said here. You know, I mean, if you look at the table on the left, the percentage of index in 1998, retail office and lodging were about 50% of the index. In 2021, they were 22% of the index. Data centers, logistics, which is industrials, um, timber companies, tower companies, that has all grown materially. Um, so, you know, the, the sector is not archaic and outdated. You know, we, we, you can be invested in stocks that are directly linked to some extent to the growth prospect of a Tencent, a Facebook, an Amazon, a Netflix, etc. cetera. Um, and part and parcel are an adjacency to those companies doing well over time. This just looks at some of the favorite subsectors we like um, with long-term good growth prospects as I was speaking of. Self-storage at the bottom there, I've explained, you know, it's doing very well as a sector, be it in the US, UK, Europe, or Australia. If I look at the residential sector, the Nordics, uh, Sweden, Finland, um, boy, those companies are countries are doing very well. Um, and as you can imagine, more and more people are moving to those countries, and that's creating an uh, excess demand with low supply of property. Germany as well, massive I suppose, shortage of properties in Berlin and the bigger cities. Um, so that continues to well, do well. And in the US, I don't know how to explain how short they are of the supply they require. Um, so post 2008, the global financial crisis hit the US particularly hard. They really did not build the houses that they needed to since 2008. And now that's coming home to roost. So you're really seeing with very low interest rates as well there, you know, the trend of household ownership is becoming more and more factored in. And then the line above that American Tower, Equinix, we're talking 5G, 185,000 plus towers in the American Towers portfolio around the world. Equinix is some of the best and, and strongest co-located data centers around the world. Um, and then Alexandria, which is biotech, is another sector which is also, we think, going to do quite well. And then the industrial sector at the top, the warehouse depot, Belgium, Luxembourg, type of uh, logistics, Seagrow, UK, Europe, logistics, Prologis, a massive global player, and Goodman, more in the Asian front. As I, as I often tell my colleagues here, you know, it's obviously here. 111 ships anchored off the coast of California, waiting to offload um, their containers into the port. You are going to see Prologis and these companies continue to do well because logistics um, is in high demand and guys cannot offload fast enough and store fast enough. And as long as those supply chains remain constrained, um, guys like Prologis, Warehouse to Poor, um, Seagrove, Will continue to do well. Seagrow in particular, because in the UK, given what's happened with Brexit, um, self storage and large logistics around London, etc., um, is in very high demand. The other dynamic also feeding through is inflation. Um, so you're seeing asset values go up in logistics more and more. You're seeing inflation come through on rentals, driving them on, on expiring rentals, and sustainably driving growth in these assets on what's potentially a, a multi-year view going forward. The one risk you must be aware of with a lot of these companies like um, logistics, towers, data centers, is, is the long lease length, the well in place underpinning them, which means that if inflation does go up more than anticipated, the valuations of those leases in terms of the DCF falls quite a bit. So that can result in an initial fall in values of some of the stocks, but often if there's no fundamental change in the underlying assets or the, or the outlook for them, that's often a buying opportunity once such as changes happen in the share prices, which is something we watch for quite a bit. This is just looking at the total return by subsectors in Q3 last year, sorry, this year, not last year. <coughs> Excuse me. 
as I said, you know, self storage has done very well, total return on that sector. Logistics or industrial also done well. Residential, again, strong secular themes underpinning all of those areas. But on the far right, you know, we, we had data centers take some pain. I think that's because of inflation expectations. Retail, retail really did well post September, October 2020, once the vaccine was announced, as did lodging and resorts. I think there's been some bit of a pullback on that side, given how well they've done. Um, and then office, you know, there's just a lot of uncertainty on that front in terms of how that space is going to evolve going forward. And if you look at the right hand side, you know, a lot of the country's returns in terms of total return is very based in terms of the subsector exposure that those countries represent if you look at the table on the left. So taking a look over the very long term here, over the last 20 years for global property, and you can see that that's the red line global property, uh, real estate 250 stocks versus the MSCI all country world index, which is the green line. Property over that period has done much better than uh, global equities. Um, so it's, it's been a good performer. And um, you know, I think it's a part of the fact that it's evolved, it's become more data centers, more tech, more logistics, more supply chain, et cetera, which has helped the sector as well. This slide looks at it since uh, December 2019. So here we're just taking a look really at um, the way the sector has done in recent years. Obviously the S&P has done incredibly well in recent times. Property has underperformed that, that basis over the last two or three years. But if you look at the, on the right hand side here, um, in terms of the subsector performance of the REITs, the sectors that have done well, its names are highlighted with the sector return. Storage stars, storage companies, industrial logistics companies, data centers, tower companies, apartments, uh, residential, and the ones at the bottom, lodging, hotels impacted by COVID quite a bit, malls, COVID, retail oversupply, e-commerce globally, office as well. You can quickly see the trends that are that are feeding with some of these asset classes and, and which are against other asset classes. This slide paints a picture of what's happened in the past few years pre-COVID, what we expect to happen through COVID, and what we expect the new normal to be post that. So we expect towers and data centers to continue performing very well, logistics as well with supply chains, just-in-time inventory, e-commerce, et cetera, also to perform very well, for pre and post-COVID. Residential as well, you know, it, it, coming through COVID was a bit of a, a difficult situation for some of the apartments, for example, um, apartments in New York City, rentals felt quite a bit as the office dynamic in Manhattan, et cetera, changed. People moved out to the Sun Belt, Colorado, et cetera. So there, it's a bit of a variance within those subsectors. So we expect that to continue doing well post 2022. Self storage as a sector, we can expect good things from that sector still over the next few years. Healthcare is an interesting sector. It's uh, healthcare includes senior housing or retirement homes. Now, obviously, COVID had a material knock on effect to the older people who were impacted severely by COVID before the vaccine. Um, that has been through there. And obviously the other thing that happened in healthcare was um, medical offices where um, procedures that were elective were not performed because of COVID and the hospital beds were required for the COVID patients also impacted that space negatively because there, are, there was high margins on those elective procedures. That, however, is all now through the wash and to improve in future years. Office, significant regional variance. You know, big difference between Manhattan, Boston, LA, London, Frankfurt. It, it's, it's just it's too much to talk about, to be honest, right now. But we expect the new normal will be a lot of uncertainty to remain in terms of how that space will play out over the next few years. And on that front, you know, we don't expect amazing things from office in the next couple of years. And then retail, yeah, look, I mean, retail is an interesting asset class globally because tenants have, well, 
I think the easiest way to say it is if you have a flagship center, a beautiful, newly revamped shopping center, which gives a great shopping experience in a big city, in the flagship location, you should be okay. Those assets are fine. Um, they will be sought out by BMW for showrooms, by e-commerce players that are moving into more water and bricks with their first few stores, et cetera. But if you have a, a secondary type of retail asset, which doesn't offer the shopping experience uh, a consumer wants, you will have an issue. So you, you can find some good assets to buy in that space, but you have to be very selective. What we're finding is that the strip malls, the smaller power centers, um, EMEA in South Africa has some exposure to that in the US, is doing quite well. Those tend to be anchored by a, by a big food anchor um, with a couple of line shops around it, like a strip mall like we would have at maybe Woodmead, would um, and that tends to do quite well in this current environment. So I just want to run you through a, a couple of, of stock examples. I mean, Prologis, as I said, is one of the, the biggest statistics players in the world. Um, you know, they've done very well in terms of total returns over the long term. We don't expect that to change in the next few years. The ESG is very good there. They have to comply with the best of the best globally in terms of the markets they're operating. Um, increasingly, they are moving into closer to the cities, um, last mile in, in logistics. People are wanting things in 20 minutes. They're not willing to wait one day anymore. Um, Just-in-time inventory is becoming more and more relevant in their lives. So you see increasingly they're moving more and more closer to the consumer. And there's little evidence that that trend is changing. So there continues to be strong demand for the big box logistics and their last mile type of logistics right now. If I look at American Tower, as I said, 185,000 plus towers around the world. For those familiar with MTN, Vodacom, Telcom, IHS, ADOS Towers, all these other tower companies, um, you can understand what this company is about. It's about 5G, it's about ultra low latency, it's about being at the edge of the networks where automate, automo sorry, automate, auto autonomous cars will start driving more and more. Um, Tesla, et cetera, those type of dynamics, uh, maybe even the metaverse, if you start moving to avatars over time, um, this is a company well-placed to take advantage of a lot of those changes happening in the world. So it's done very well over time. It's got strong growth expected over the next few years. And uh, as they lease up their towers more and more and provide the, the real estate for more and more cell phone operators to put their equipment on masts, um, it tends to be on, on a very good wicket. We're also finding they're moving into adjacencies. There was a recent announcement then considering the acquisition of data centers. So towers with data centers and fire, um, creating a story that is quite positive potentially over the long term. As I was talking to you on storage, you know, as I said, life happens. Um, it's a fascinating space to be in. It's very linked to the residential cycle. As residential does well, um, we tend to find storage also tends to do well. And that also is a sign that the economy is, uh, is also doing well. It's an underlying level. The margins in the space are also very high, um, around 70% operating margin, which, which are very strong. And the CAGR growth in NOI um, is also strong, given that for self-storage and hotels, um, those are two sectors where if inflation comes through, because your leases are so short, you can very quickly react and move to market and take advantage and capture some of the rental upside. Equity lifestyle, we spoke of manufactured homes. Um, this is a company which offers you lifestyle type living in communities um, on the east and west coast of the US and in Florida and those parts of the US as well. Um, again, doing very, very well, seeing strong demand um, for its assets. Uh, FFO growth and DPS growth CAG out of 9 and 25% respectively over 14 years. Um, very strong underpinning numbers and very good financial strength of this company. And then Deutsche Wohnen, I mean, this company is 90% owned by Vonovia. That's German residential, also moving into other markets adjacent to, to Germany. Um, again, shortage of housing. I mean, this is a theme we're seeing playing out across Europe 
across the Nordics, across US, and it's a multi-year thing that's playing out very much. You know, it's also becoming harder and harder for, for kids to afford their own homes, um, given how much, how, how much capital appreciation a lot of housing is seen in a lot of these markets. That means people have to rent more and more. And this is where these companies like Deutsche Wohnen, Bonovia, Equity Lifestyle, are very well positioned to take advantage or to provide the, the, say the, the housing for those people that can only rent and not own. Also, if you start to think that inflation will pick up, that will also drive uh, housing pricing up as well. And if you are of the view that um, you know, you're going to see interest rates rise in the US, you're going to start seeing a pullback in mortgages given out or, or, or provided, which will also make this. So I suppose what I'm saying is it's a lot of positive catalysts underpinning housing globally. And there's an ongoing shortage of that, which will remain place, it seems, for many years. I'm not even going to try to pronounce this name. It's a Nordic company. We call it SBB or Big Nats by its model, but a little bit of its name there. It's a, it's a fascinating company in the Nordic space. Um, the municipalities own a lot of the community property in the Nordic space. They've taken a view in many instances that they will do a sale and lease back. So they'll sell it to a property company like Big Nats, let's say a police station. Uh, big Nans will improve the police station, bring it up to scratch, better than the municipality could have done it, lease it back to the municipality over 15 years or, or whatever. The municipality is left with a better asset at the end of the day. Um, it, it's a great story. Um, and they're able to develop a, a ton of buildings with a long development pipeline in these markets. So it's, it's, it's just a very, very defensive company. Average lease length better than 10 years and uh, triple A grade type tenant be backed by the, by the governments in a lot of these Nordic countries behind the municipalities. I also want to touch on ESG. I mean, this is very important because we live in a world where profit, profiteering is one thing, but doing the right thing is also incredibly important. If you look at companies like Prologis with some of the buildings they're doing in the neighborhood, they're moving to zero emission with solar, with water, with heat pumps, et cetera, triple paid windows, they're moving to zero carbon emissions on some of the new developments. If you look at the bottom left, they're talking of honeybee initiatives. I know it might sound funny to some of you, but you know, there's an underpinning understanding in the world that without bees, um, all the plants will die. Something needs to pollinate them. And the companies are in the property sector are taking steps to relocate the hives where they find it or to ensure that honeybees um, continue to be able to, to pollinate wherever they are. Bird species protection. I mean, you know, this was fascinating for me, just an anecdotal story, but, you know, some people put up bird spikes on their buildings. Um, the thought process I thought is that is a humane thing to do, but apparently the birds get injured. So in some of these companies, they, as funny as it is, bring a falcon around every six months, fly the falcon around, it scares off the pigeons. They don't have to put the bird spikes on, the birds don't get injured, and the falcon does its job, which is uh, quite an interesting thing to do. Um, and then on the right-hand side, the sustainable development goals, more and more companies are, are signing up to the UN SDGs in terms of doing the right thing for the climate, creating sustainable communities, et cetera, poverty alleviation, um, and those type of steps, which are all good and well. And uh, you can invest in companies that are not only doing well financially and providing a good dividend, but are also doing the right thing from the ESG perspective. This is the last slide, and I want to focus on, on it in a bit of detail. Vea Hauser, it's a timber REIT in the United States. Now you can imagine, as a timber REIT, all of its assets are effectively a, a heat sink or a, a sink for carbon dioxide. Um, so they remove 32 million metric tons of CO2 and they emit 7 million tons of CO2. Um, you know, the building standards have changed globally. You can now build up to 18 stories of, in a tall wood building, it used to be five stories. So there's huge demand for wood buildings, more so than steel and cement, which are, which are heavy producers of CO2. Wood, however, captures it and stores it away. And then renewables, you know, all this land can be used for solar energy, wind energy, mitigation banking, which is where when you damage a habitat, 
by law you are required to create a similar habitat to offset the damage you've done. So, you know, it's a company we look at. It scores very highly on ESG principles. Um, we're looking at it as an entry point in terms of the share price. Um, we, we love what it does from an ESG perspective. And, um, you know, you can invest in good companies, very good companies um, for the climate, for the environment, um, as well as with good growth outcomes. So, I mean, if, if I can just leave you with two key thoughts. On, on the SA side, a lot of the SA property companies have offshore assets in their mix. Um, a lot of the bad news on SA assets are now in the numbers. And we are getting to that low double digit growth environment for SA property going forward than was historically the case. The difference this time, however, is it's going to be more income return than capital return. So historically, you'd get 7% yield, 6% capital return. It's now going to be more like 9, 10% income return, 2, 3% capital return on the SA side. If you are invested in property, it's very hard to ignore the global property story. There are a lot of companies in a lot of niche markets offering good returns and doing the right things. So if you do, are looking at property, I would strongly suggest you consider global property as part of your investment thesis um, together with SA property. And you can get a fair amount of SA property stocks that you offer your global exposure as well. Thank you. All right, that was absolutely excellent. And I think you have answered every question that came up as the questions came. Within minutes, you would have answered it. Um, the only one not perhaps is, is, is Telcom Towers, which is going to be listing, I think, maybe Q1 next year. My sense is we need to get some insights, I suppose, in terms of, of valuations. But it is an, an interesting addition to the, the property space on the JSC in that it's a, it's a sector we haven't normally had. As you said, it's our REITs in South Africa dominated by sort of retail logistics uh, and, and, and office. I mean, I, you know, it would be lovely to have a SA property tower REIT company. What you often find with these tower companies is they tend to reach a stage of maturity or lease up, where they have the two or three tenants on each mast before they become mature enough and certainty on the dividend um, before they're willing to, to become in part of the REIT regime. Um, it's something we'll definitely be watching. Uh, we would love to be able to take advantage of that with the valuation. Yeah, no, and I think was, I, I was actually hoping that MTN would pop their towers in there as well, but that was frankly a, a, a bit of a long shot. MTN that stuck it off into the US one. Uh, folks, literally every question that came through has been touched on uh, at some point in the presentation. So I'm going to park it there. Uh, I'm at Matara Listed Property Analyst Stanlip. Uh, that was truly insightful. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, S Triple B. I'm going to I'm going I'm, I'm to find someone to pronounce that for me. I'll send you a voice note. I don't think I've seen a word quite that big. Uh, ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. I would really, really appreciate your time for the presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Cheers all.